the hit Netflix show Mindhunter is based on the memoirs of FBI Special Agent John E. Douglas, one of the pioneers of criminal profiling. Douglas joined the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit way back in 1977 and soon thereafter began meeting with infamous serial killers and serial rapists. In many ways, Douglas's early career mirrored that of Robert Ressler, an FBI special agent who also served in the Behavioral Science Unit. Ressler is also the man who is often credited with creating the term serial killer. In a strange twist, both Ressler and Douglas conducted extensive interviews with one Monty, some sources write Monty, Russell. Russell's name is not as infamous as Gacy, Bundy, or Dahmer. However, Russell, a serial rapist turned serial killer, provided both Ressler and Douglas with a fountain of information regarding the mindsets of serial offenders, especially sexual predators. Between 1976 and 1977, Russell terrorized the young women of Northern Virginia. Handsome and intelligent, Russell fits the archetype of the truly dangerous hunter, a man dedicated to turning his fantasy world into reality. Number 10. Early Life Like a lot of serial killers, Monty Ralph Russell grew up in a highly dysfunctional home. In fact, Russell lived through two broken homes. Russell's biological father, a postal employee named William L. Russell, left the family when Monty was just seven years old. Later, Russell's mother married Milbert Hendry, who went by the nickname Hank. Hank relocated the family from Wellington, Kansas, to Sacramento, California. Russell hated his stepfather. This hatred likely influenced Mrs. Russell's decision to divorce Hendry in 1970. After that, Monty, his mother, and his brother and sister moved to Washington, D.C. After 1970, Russell lived in a home without adult male supervision, and because of that, Russell began indulging in his powerful fantasy life. However, years later, Russell told Ressler during a jailhouse interview that if he had been sent to live with Hendry back in 1970, then he would have gone to law school instead of becoming a serial killer. Number 9. The Crime Start At the age of 14, Russell committed his first rape. Two years before this crime, Russell was put on probation for allegedly breaking into an apartment and stealing about $100 worth of items. Nine days after that, Russell caused a ruckus at John Adams Middle School, which he was attending at the time. Then, in 1971, Russell was charged with stealing $27 from a community pool near where he lived. A month later, Russell stole a car. All of these offenses pointed to a sort of acceleration that reached its first peak on April 16, 1973. On that day, Russell robbed and raped a woman who lived at his apartment complex on North Armistead Street in Alexandria, Virginia. Because of this crime, Russell was sent to a psychiatric hospital in Florida. Despite his incarceration, Russell committed five rapes during this time. Eventually, Russell was released in 1975 and thereafter dropped out of high school at age 17. Number 8. The Murder of Aura Marina Gabor According to Ressler in his book Whoever Fights Monsters, the catalyst for Russell's first murder was a breakup. In August 1976, Russell's girlfriend, who was one year older and had just entered college, sent him a Dear John letter informing Russell that their relationship was over. Angered, Russell drove to his ex's college and observed her walking with her new boyfriend. Instead of confronting the two, Russell drove back to his apartment complex and sulked in his parked car with a beer and a joint. At around 1 a.m. on the morning of August 4, 26-year-old prostitute Aura Marina Gabor returned to her apartment complex. She just so happened to live in the same complex as Russell. Russell approached Gabor's car with a knife and attempted to rob her. The pair began having sex after Russell promised not to hurt Gabor. The fact that Gabor willingly had sex with Russell and seemed to enjoy it angered the teenage killer. Russell killed Gabor by strangling her with her own brassiere. Number 7. The Murder of Ursula Miltenberger Ursula Miltenberger was originally from Ridgely, West Virginia. She was a farm girl and a big one, 
standing 175 centimeters and weighing 77 kilograms. An active, somewhat precocious youth, Meidelberger left Ridgely for the big city of Washington, D.C. After moving into an apartment in Fairfax County, Virginia, the 22-year-old Miltenberger began working as a bill collector and a part-time management trainee for a McDonald's franchise. The last time anyone saw Ursula alive was in March 1977 at approximately 2.10 a.m. Before leaving a McDonald's in Lincoln, yeah, Milton Berger had reportedly told a co-worker that she had plans to attend a party that night. On March 6, 1977, a horseback rider discovered Ursula's body near a housing complex in Burke. Milton Berger was found with her hands and feet bound, and investigators noted that she had been both struck with a blunt object and stabbed multiple times. The initial report said that Ursula had not been sexually assaulted. Number 6. The Murder of Gladys Ross Bradley Gladys Bradley was only 27 years old when she was murdered by Monty Russell. At the time of her death, Bradley was a clerk in a Virginia post office. Bradley was also a former member of the Job Corps and a student who studied floral design. Bradley lived at the Holmes Run Park Apartment Complex, located at 5420 North Morgan Street in Alexandria. Most of Russell's victims also lived at this same complex. Unlike Russell's prior victims, Bradley was a divorced mother of one and African American. In April 1977, Russell waited for Bradley outside her apartment. In his hands, he carried a knife from his mother's house. Russell raped Bradley several times and then drowned her in a nearby creek. Bradley's body was found on April 30th by police. According to Douglas in his book Mind Hunter, the Bradley case showed that Russell no longer feared getting caught and, as a result, had truly begun enjoying his crimes. Number 5. The Murder of Jeanette McClelland Jeanette McClelland, 24 years old, was in a good mood in May 1977. She had recently completed craftsman's training as graphics design proofreader. This was all part of McClellan's greater plan of becoming a journalist. Unfortunately, McClellan's dream ended on May 5, 1977. On that day, McClellan's body was found not far from a housing complex along Virginia's Shirley Highway. McClellan, like Bradley and some of the others, lived at the Holmes Run Park apartment complex on North Morgan Street. Investigators learned early on that Jeanette's killer had stabbed her some 24 times. She had also been raped prior to death. McClelland was white and unmarried, and for the majority of her life, she had lived with her parents in Springfield, Virginia. McClelland was last seen alive working at the Brewer Graphics Company in Springfield, where her shift lasted from 7 p.m. to 3 a.m. Russell likely saw McClelland near the apartment complex and soon began stalking her. Number 4. The Murder of Aletha Bird Russell's final murder occurred sometime between April 10 and May 17, 1977. Bird was much older than Russell's other victims, being 34, some sources say 35, at the time of her death. Like Bradley, Bird was African American, divorced, and a mother. Bird had a steady job at a Woodward and Lothrop store located in Tyson's Corner, Virginia. On April 2, 1977, Bird began a well-deserved vacation. Eight days later, Bird was reported missing to the police. Bird would not be found again until May 17. On that day, investigators discovered her body in a wooded area in Fairfax County. She had been stabbed 14 times. Again, like so many of the other victims, Bird lived at the Holmes Run Park apartment complex. Number 3. One Day Later Monty Russell's murder spree ended one day after Aletha Bird's body was discovered. Russell, who was already under police surveillance at the time due to his past convictions, was caught in a roadblock. When police searched Russell's car, they found Bird's wallet and other personal possessions. The case against Russell had been building since at least March 8, 1977. At that time, two police officers, Alexandria Police Officer Detective John W. Turner and an unnamed Fairfax County investigator, 
began looking into the similarities between the Miltenberger and Gabor murders. Turner noticed that both Gabor and Miltenberger had been murdered not far from their cars, and this pattern reappeared following the discovery of Gladys Bradley's body. Turner, who had known Russell since the 1973 rape and robbery case, drew a triangle on a map that connected Gabor's car, Bradley's car, and Russell's apartment. Russell's fingerprints were later matched to prints found on Miltenberger's car, which further sealed the killer's fate. Ultimately, on May 18, 1977, Russell admitted to kidnapping, raping, and killing all five women. Russell was just 18 at the time of his confession. Number 2. Prison and Parole Denial In 1995, Russell went up for parole for the first time. Originally, at his 1977 trial, Russell had been convicted and received four consecutive life sentences for his crimes. The news of Russell's parole hearing kicked off a minor firestorm in Northern Virginia. The families of his victims protested the fact that the cold-hearted killer might once again enjoy freedom. The cries of the protesters proved loud enough that Russell's parole was denied in 1995. Since then, Russell has been put up for parole every year, and every year he has been denied. The reasons for refusal include, history of violence, indicates serious risk to the community, serious nature and circumstances of offense, release at this time would diminish seriousness of crime, and prior failures and or convictions while under community supervision, therefore, unlikely to comply with conditions of release. Number 1. Highly Intelligent Killer When Ressler and Douglas began researching Russell and conducting interviews with him, both were shocked to learn that his IQ had been scored at over 120. This means that Russell is one of the more intelligent serial killers in history. Besides this, Douglas notes in Mindhunter that Russell never showed any remorse for his crimes. However, both Ressler and Douglas learned a lot about serial killer behavior from Russell, for instance, both investigators noted that Russell usually killed after a triggering event or stressor. For instance, Russell raped and murdered Gabor following a bad breakup with his girlfriend. Russell's crimes also showed a high level of depersonalization, as the killer began thinking of his victims as something other than fully human. However, Douglas noted that sometimes, this depersonalization did not work, for instance, Russell let one of his victims go after she told him that her father had cancer. Russell must have felt some empathy, considering that his older brother had cancer at the time. Most importantly, Russell's admission that his crimes were predated by years of intense sexual fantasies convinced Wrestler and Douglas that this is a dynamic shared by almost all sexual predators. Essentially, after years of dreaming about sex and violence, a teenage Russell could longer fight temptation.